So Ben is uh, uh, our speaker tonight. He's a fourth generation urban gardener and a graduate of University of Guelph and Dalhousie University in Halifax. Uh, you may recognize his family name. Uh, he learned the tricks of the trade from his father, Mark Cullen, who's a longtime Canadian horticulture educator, and he's a best-selling author. Uh, ben and Mark are now working together, promoting and developing horticulture education. And he's gonna speak to us tonight on the topic of water-wise gardening. So I will, I just have to turn on Ben's video here, just a moment. Okay, Ben, you're unmuted. Okay, and you've asked for me to start my video. Start your engines. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Scott. Uh, yeah, Scott, do I have control here. of the forward back on these slides, or will I have to make a nod? Oh, if, so if you, you've got your, have you got your slides up? Oh, okay. If you, hit, if you hit share screen, ah, if you got it. share your screen at the bottom through Zoom, uh, then we'll all see them. All right. Pardon everyone. I uh, will get this up right now. This is a benefit of working from home is I have everything on hand. So um, I'll, I guess I'll just have to open both, hit share screen. Yeah, if you launch your, uh, your presentation, have it full screen and then when you share press screen. share screen in, in Zoom. Uh, we'll stop others, yep. And let's go to share region of Waterloo, water wise gardening. So um, Scott, does that look like it's working for people? Yeah, I can see that. I see, uh, I see your whole PowerPoint menu, but once you make it full screen, uh, yeah, that looks perfect. And, perfect. We, and just so you know, we can see your cursor too. So if you want to point at things, um, oh. we'll be able to see that. Very handy. Yeah, Thank you, Scott. And um, credit to Scott for making this work because this is my first time um, doing one of these video presentations from home. And I was glad because, you know, we had a lot of public speaking lined up for the spring and everything got canceled starting with the night before Canada Bloom's opener, everything got shut. Spring got canceled. Uh, and that was a real heartbreaker for me and my dad. So, uh, you know, I appreciate everybody willing to sign on here and uh, join me in this uh, online webinar from my home. I hope nobody's allergic to dogs because my dog Ruby will probably come in and out at some point, but uh, we won't let that be a distraction. Uh, <clears throat> so region of Waterloo, water wise gardening. Scott had to give me a bit of a lesson on what the region of Waterloo means. It's a big encompassing area. Um, I rode my bike down to Hespler today. I guess that's in Waterloo as well. Um, Lots of beautiful places in Waterloo. And of course, water is ever so important because you have the Grand River running right through it. And um, the way we garden, I think what we're going to talk about is how the way we garden affects our watersheds, our water supply. And um, yeah, so we're going to explore that, try and keep it light, but also focus on the things that you can do in your yard to make a difference. Um, and I'm going to talk about the highland people and the lowland people. Um, so who am I? Scott did a pretty good job. I'm Ben Cullen. That's me. That's what I look like. I'm the son of a gardener. Um, is this, hang on, I've got a floating screen in my corner that shows my face. Do you, does everybody see that or do you only see the slides? Oh yeah, we can see that, you know, uh, and if it's going to obscure the slides, I can also turn that go. off or if I just, min yeah. I just minimized it. Great. Small hiccups, yeah, but all, here we are. All of you, tell all the viewers that, uh, yeah, they can also move that little box around. Uh, so you can slide this thing around. Want. There you go. Now move it over to your left. You can move it to your right. Your left-handed, right-handed, whatever you want. Okay, so um, I'm the son of a gardener. I'm also the grandson of a gardener. So yeah, that's dad. Most of you probably recognize that guy. Um, he's okay. <laughs> he's good. He's good stuff. So I'm lucky I get to work uh, with dad. I'm also the grandson of a gardener. So um, if you migrated from the GTA and you knew Wheel and Cullen Nurseries, um, that was very much a brainchild of my grandfather, Len Cullen. Uh, but really, um, the wheel part of Wheel and Cullen, now we're frozen. Um, oh, there we go. Um, is not my great grandfather. <laughs> so the fourth generation thing is a bit of a stretch. I'm actually the great grandson of a milkman um, who, incidentally, uh, brought milk out to Waterloo. 
Um, but there's my grandpa and John Wheel. So John Wheel is really the fourth generation. He was a horticulturalist from England, moved to Guelph. So I often run into people around Guelph, Kitchener, Waterloo, who knew him. He taught at the university. He taught horticulture there. And um, he's the wheel of Wheel and Cullen. So grandpa bought John out of John Wheel Landscaping in 1947. And that's really where it began for us, the Cullens. So um, that's sort of the history. I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's just history. And we're here to talk about water wise gardening. But um, I guess I somewhat come by it honestly. There's dad and I. There's this is not a recent photo. I don't look like that anymore. Uh, but that on your left is a more recent photo. Uh, so that's dad and I at the greenhouse, probably this time of year, a few years ago. Uh, and it's my wife, Sam. I always put Sam in the presentation because um, she's shy. And I wish she would do the presentation with me. But also, she is a soil scientist. She did her master's in so, uh, agroecology. And uh, she actually works at a company in Cambridge called Listech, homegrown um, success story. It was a technology developed at the University of Waterloo that converts human waste into biosolids. And um, they have that technology in plants all over North America. So Sam's responsible for that. And because she knows more about soil than I do, I run a lot of my questions by her. So if uh, you can at least be confident in knowing that anything I'm going to tell you has been voted vetted by Sam. Um, so yeah, she's done a Hespler in 401 uh, day to day. I'm also a master gardener in training, and um, I love being a part of the master gardeners because everybody knows so much, everybody's so passionate. Uh, I'm not a full blown master gardener yet. I got challenged that exam. I'm not there yet, but um, they're a great resource. So if you ever have a gardening question uh, out of turn, uh, we have a hotline, and I'm sure the, uh, the Kitchener, that's the Guelph Wellington master gardeners have a hotline, but I'm sure that the master gardeners in Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge would as well. Uh, lots of knowledgeable folks there who can give you good advice. So um, I've learned a lot from them just through the training. So green gardening, there's a bunch of dahlias. Um, we're going to talk about lawns because it's almost lawn season um, and lawns occupy such a substantial square footage of our private land. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that. I think that should change. And Scott, he probably thinks that should change as well. Most people who, who deal with water think that. Uh, but we'll talk about it. And uh, we're going to talk about water and nutrient management. That's where it really gets interested. That's where you get the blooming and the growing. Because grass doesn't really do much. Meadowbrook Golf Club, that is uh, where I kind of cut my teeth in high school, working on the greens crew. I was there for four years. And, um, you know, I'm just going to go through this quickly. Um, <laughs> so spring lawn care. What should you be doing right now? Rake with a soft rake, not a hard rake, because a hard rake, I see people out there this time of year with a hard rake, they're tearing their grass out of the ground. So you're effectively thinning the grass um, so that weeds can just come in. Uh, what you want to use is a soft rake. Just fluff it up, get the, um, get the thatch out of there. Uh, you only need a soft rake to do that. Aerate it if you're on heavy ground. Fertilize. Uh, I don't fully endorse fertilizing, but if you're going to do it, this is the second most important time of year to do it. The most important time of year to fertilize is actually in the fall with a fall fertilizer when the plant is putting energy down into its roots. So uh, a lot of people fertilize twice a year. Some people fertilize three times a year. I don't fertilize at all. But um, if you're going to fertilize, um, spring is the second most important time. And then you want to overseed. And um, overseeding to me is the most important thing on this list because um, if you're going to outcompete weeds, the best way to do it is by overseeding. And that is to say, you'll minimize the amount of time you spend uh, tearing weeds out of the soil or having to spray. Um, by overseeding, you increase the population of those grass plants that you want. And then mow. Um, and don't mow too short, especially as we get into the dry part of the season. Um, and that's, that's it for lawns for now, because really we're here to talk about water-wise gardening and there's nothing wise about growing a lawn if you're really worried about soil or, or water for that matter, because, um, well, it's not as bad as asphalt or concrete. Um, it doesn't serve a lot of ecological services by having a huge lawn. So what does, and why does water-wise gardening matter? Well, water is obviously our most important resource. I don't need to tell anybody that. Um, but 
how's it changing? Well, the climate is changing. That's a fact. No debate about that. Um, and what does that mean in terms of water? Because water is such a huge part of the atmosphere and the climate. It means more rain less often. So um, that's a picture of Go Commuter Train in Toronto. Toronto has been having serious problems with uh, flooding uh, because the infrastructure is just overwhelmed. And, um, and drought is a bigger problem in the global south. Uh, that picture in the top right was taken in the Atlas Mountains in uh, Morocco. Sam and I were there three years ago. Um, I think it is far more likely to disrupt food supplies uh, in those parts of the world, Central America. Um, but certainly we're seeing much more difficult droughts in our part of the world as well. And the way that you garden, I mean, thankfully, we live somewhere where we can kind of adapt, not that climate change is okay, but we can change what we're doing um, and get more ecological value out of our gardens um, and sustain more beauty throughout the season. This is Toronto Island, uh, which a couple of years ago was shut down for most of the, um, the season uh, due to flooding. And this is the Cheltenham Badlands. Um, erosion is the other problem. So when you have more rain less often, not only do you get flooding, it's also incredibly damaging to soil health because the impact of all that water coming at once, rather than like a nice soft summer rain, uh, but more like a storm rain, is that it crashes down on the soil and it carries it away. And that top layer of soil is incredibly valuable for supporting plant life um, and also sinking carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, so we're gonna talk about erosion management in this presentation as well. And um, so, and drought. So this is a picture again from that trip to Morocco. I don't know how well you can see this photograph. You see my clicker, there's a little bit of green in the foreground and there's a little bit of green in the background and that dry strip that separates the green is a river and that um that river is supposed to bring fertility to uh, those green patches this is supposed to be kind of a minimal agricultural area and um they were praying for rain when we were there that, that i wish i could remember i think it had been 14 months since they'd since they'd had rain um and we were there in the quote-unquote rainy season you can see none so um, big, big problem, the basics, how to water. <clears throat> so um, if you're watering right now, a lot of people would have seedlings going and we always start our seedlings too early because we get bored around late February. <laughs> and um, so right now we've got big seedlings and we keep having to repot them so that they don't get root bound in their little plugs. Uh, and that's okay. Um, it just means we're gonna have a head start on the season, but it does create more work. So if you've got seedlings, it's a good place to start, but this applies to everything in your garden. Water deeper and water, I'm getting used to this, less often. So, um, you know, rather than just going out every night after dinner through the summer and standing there with a hose for until you get bored. <laughs> um, I mean, every you know, some people would do that. Uh, I get bored really easily. So I'm never going to water very effectively by hand. Uh, it's good to set yourself up with a low flow watering system uh, and let it run until the ground is really saturated. Um, and that can take a number of hours. Um, if the So this is a weeping hose. That could take a number of hours if you have a long enough weeping hose and, and you're growing enough produce or if you have large enough beds. Um, but that's okay. You want to saturate the soil um, and then leave it and then let it get dry. Let it get very dry. Uh, it's okay even to stress those plants a little bit um, because what it will do is it will train those plants to put down deeper roots and they're going to be healthier plants. And this applies to everything that you grow, including your lawn. So don't water your lawn more than once a week and do it with something like the sweeping hose, which rather than, well, you wouldn't use a weeping hose on a lawn, I suppose, but you would use a low flow uh, sprinkler, something to that effect, um, because these really dramatic, sometimes they're copper, sometimes they're whatever, um, water fountains to blast water up into the air. You know, that's great if your grandkids or kids want to splash around in it. Um, it's not great for watering plants. And Scott would probably actively discourage you from just buying a sprinkler so you 
can run around in it. Uh, go to the public pool. <laughs> um, no, you want to get to the root zone because furthermore, if you're, if we're talking vegetables, uh, which is what I like to grow the most and which weeping hoses really work best for, um, you don't want water on the foliage anyway. Um, crops like, uh, cucurbits, like, um, squash, cucumber, um, and, uh, pumpkins, uh, even potatoes, to be honest, they all have uh, they all have a susceptibility to leaf-borne fungal disease, and uh, all those fungal diseases require a certain amount of moisture. You can cut out that disease by watering straight to the root zone. Same with your roses. Don't water the don't water the leaves. Don't use a, a sprinkler that's just going to blast it through the air so it lands on the plant. No, go to the root zone um, and use something like this. Or if you're going to water by hand, if you have the patience to do so. Um, just bypass the top of the plant um, because really it's, it's about pulling the water up from the roots. You can also find something like this. This is a root waterer. And this is most useful for containers and baskets. So more and more people are growing um, vegetables in containers. Um, there's raised beds too, but containers are popular. And of course, uh, people downsizing, condo balconies, that type of thing. People are growing in containers. It's a growing trend. That's good. Um, but if you live in one of these situations, especially the condos, you can get that baking hot sun um, that just sends the, just seems to cook the water right out of the pots, basically. Or if it's really windy, that can be a difficult challenge as well. Benefit of something like this, a root waterer, is that it's a lot less mess because you're not watering the top of the pot. If you know, if you've ever been desperate to rehydrate a pot that's really dried out, you know, sometimes the, the soil, the growing medium can't absorb the moisture fast enough. So the water just rolls off the top and it makes a huge mess of your patio for one. It's also a waste of water and you're probably gonna lose some of your container mix. And if you fertilize, you're gonna lose some of your fertilizer that way. So um, this spike screws on the end of your hose or a nozzle, just stick it into the soil and hold it there until you start to see water literally kind of uh, almost seeping out. And then, you know, you've saturated the pot and that's the watering deeper, less often and watering efficiently because you're not losing it to run off. So simple little thing like that. That's, I have to say this, that's a home hardware thing. Uh, hey, hey, we're Kitchener Waterloo. We like home hardware. They're just up the road uh, in St. Jacobs there. So that'll be about 10 or 11 bucks and uh, worth the dough. And um, another thing that you can do is get our rain barrel. So um, Scott, is your audio active? Uh, yeah, I, I can turn it on when I okay. need to. Yeah. Uh, are there any programs in uh, Waterloo Region for connecting people with rain barrels? Yeah, for sure. We've had a rain barrel sale for a lot of years. Um, we do sort of a truckload sale in the spring every year. Uh, obviously, this year we had to uh, change that. So we're working on an alternative way to sell rain barrels. But yeah, we've, we've had a pretty successful rain barrel program here. Good. Great. Um, and you haven't got the details of the current rain barrel sale, have you? Not quite, unfortunately. We're, uh, we're, we're going to do online ordering and uh, looking at home delivery or pickup options, but nothing, nothing is for sure yet. It's still a work in progress. Okay. Well, to the people that are listening, if you're still listening, if you haven't tuned me out, um, <laughs> because I don't know what else is going on, guys. There's nothing else going on, so I'm glad you're still here. Um, <laughs> Rather than um, yeah, pay attention to Scott's program, keep an eye out because um, there's different ways. This is Mark Stoyce, Mom Hardware, got to say it. You can buy them, but a lot of municipalities have programs. And the reason that Scott is so eager to put a rain barrel in your property is because it's actually more economical for you to retain some of this storm water and put it on your garden when it's dry than to have all of these thousands of leaders crashing down into the municipal infrastructure and creating backlog. So uh, you're actually doing a civil civic duty by retaining water on your property. And then we're gonna get into the other way, other ways how, but that's why these municipal programs exist. So, uh, and so in the long run, you end up with lower taxes because these infrastructure programs cost a fortune to put in a new you know, concrete outlet or whatever storm drain um, but also rain water is better for your garden. Um, there's a neat old one that's made out of a whiskey barrel. Uh, rain water is better for your garden. And the reason for that is because, uh, one, 
some people say it's charged with more oxygen because when the rain falls from the sky, it gets oxygenated, lands on uh, the roof of your house. No harm in that. People have asked me, do asphalt tingle, uh, shingles taint the rainwater in my rain barrel? No, don't worry about it. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I've never seen anything to prove that it does. Um, so is does it contain more oxygen? Yes, typically. Um, and oxygen is important and you need to get oxygen into the root zone of the plants. Uh, so that's positive. But the major reason for watering from a rain barrel is that the temperature is going to be what your plants want. Imagine, I mean, plants aren't that different from humans. Um, would you jump in a cold shower? No, there's a reason we have water heaters in our homes. Um, plants are similar. And if you water out of a cold well or out of the municipal uh, tap, you can shock your plants, especially your heat seeking plants like your peppers and your tomatoes. They really don't like that cold water. Whereas if you have um, a rain barrel in the summertime, it's kind of at the ambient temperature outdoors, it's going to be much less stressful for the plants. Um, and so not only are you doing a civic duty, you're doing a duty to your plants. They're going to be much happier. So, and you might save some money. I don't know what your water bills are like over there. Our water bill in Guelph, it's not cheap. Um, <clears throat> plant selection. So this is where it gets really interesting, I think, um, because not all plants are created equal. I don't have to tell anybody that. We're dealing with kind of a dual crisis. There's the climate change crisis. There's also the biodiversity crisis. And um, I just read a really interesting book by a, a conservation ecologist named Doug Tellamy called Nature's Best Hope. And basically what he's advocating for is we can help mitigate the decline of the honey, well, not just the honeybee, all bees, uh, pollinators, birds, by creating habitat on our properties. And Alana is not a habitat. Uh, we're talking about restoring native species. And if you need to exercise your imagination uh, for what that would look like, think about a Carolinian forest. And if you don't know what that looks like, it's very sad because where we live was kind of in the heart of the Carolinian zone, which was continuous almost from Toronto to Windsor. And it gets sadder. The, the further you go down the 401, the closer you get to Windsor, the fewer trees there are, which is sad because the Carolinian zone is so special. It supports so much biodiversity. You have all these tree species that are native to this area. And in Essex County, you have now one of the lowest tree covers in Southern Ontario. It's all been cleared away for agriculture, um, housing, factories, 401, whatever. Um, but your property can be a very important refuge for the species, like such as the monarch butterfly um, that migrate through the Carolinian zone and depend on the fodder, the habitat that, that historically existed here. So um, where do you start? Well, you start, yeah. If you want to think about, so tell me or an ecologist would say it's about the carrying capacity of your yard. Um, you want to create sort of layers, right? So the Carolinian zone is a forest. So you have tall, um, to mostly, the most famous Carolinian species are sort of the hardwoods, um, the oaks and the maples that are native to Southern Ontario. That's the tall stuff, but also shrubs, like uh, alternately dogwoods. And then you have the flowers, the pretty flowers that you actually see the insects landing on. So here's a list of native perennials that are gonna attract more pollinators. Um, and because they are native to here, they don't require as much um, care because this is, what they're built for, Southern Ontario. So rather than trying to nurture an exotic with all the right conditions and fertilizer, um, they're built for this. They'll get the nutrients they need from a healthy local soil type. Um, and um, they do a lot of biological servicing. The other benefit of growing perennials is because they exist year over year, they put down more root mass, which uh, has so many benefits. Mostly it allows the plants to thrive during a drought because they can go deeper into the soil to get that moisture. But also having root mass in your garden will protect against things like erosion, which we're talking about at the top of this presentation. Um, and as we get more storm-like rains, as opposed to gentle summer rains, erosion is going to become a problem. Uh, and of course, uh, root mass uh, biodegrades over time. It ends up sequestering more carbon in the soil, which we should be concerned with. So um, if you're interested in this, 
Um, I have a couple more slides. That's a list that you can look at. I'm, I'm, I'm still on video, I think. So these are two books that I happen to have on my desk because I enjoy them so much. Lorraine Johnson is local. She grew up in Galt, I think. Now she lives in Toronto. But Lorraine Johnson is Canada's native plant expert. She's got a few books. One is called 100 Easy to Grow Native Plants for Canadian Gardens. That's this one. So check that book out. So Lorraine Johnson, 100 Easy to Grow Native Plants. And uh, the other one is Grow Wild Native Plant Gardening in Canada. So if you're thinking of putting in a native plant garden, those are two great resources. You can find them online. Um, Lorraine's an interesting person to follow. So Natives starts with that. And there's some of the reasons why. How are we doing for time? I don't want to fall behind. Uh, oh, 7.30. Perfect. Um, succulents, creeping thyme, ornamental grasses. Um, so that's sort of, these are your lower layers, um, essentially living mulches. And I'm going to talk about mulch too. Um, so give you some color and the ornamental grasses. You have natives. Um, and don't hate me for saying this. Some of the non-natives, Carl Forrester's very popular, uh, Miscanthus sinensis, Chinese silvergrass, very popular. They're very pretty. Um, and the birds love them and they have year round interest and they are so low maintenance. Again, as I sort of advocate about for moving away from that expanse of lawn, which has very shallow roots and supports very little biodiversity and retains very little water in a storm season, um, an ornamental grass will put down deeper roots. It'll look better in a drought and you don't have to mow it. You cut it down once a year um, and I, we leave ours up through the, through the winter. Um, so you have some winter interest. The birds love it. Uh, you have all sorts of habitat there. And then the spring, you cut it down. And that, to me, is a much nicer job than firing up the two-stroke lawnmower, um, uh, you know, every week or however, how often you might cut your lawn. Um, so there's Lorraine's book. I always plug that book. So <clears throat> here's sort of an example of levels, very low maintenance garden. My dad, it's actually from my dad's place. Uh, my dad's on 10 acres. He's in way over his head. Um, so he's constantly looking for ways to cut back maintenance because even if you're Canada's whatever, maybe most enthusiastic or ambitious gardener, um, which he is and he's good, uh, there's only so much one man can do on 10 acres. So he put in this berm, which is not a concession by any means. It's beautiful, but it's virtually no maintenance, which is great. And so that's why I always put it in here um, because there is a fear of shifting away from lawns and saying, oh, I don't know how to garden. The weeds are going to get ahead of me. No, they're not. Um, start small. The beauty of it is you can add one square foot at a time, dig up some lawn, put in a plant, dig up some lawn, put in a plant. Before you know it, you have a native plant paradise um, that's, you know, doing all of this biological servicing for us. And it's gorgeous. It's prettier. So this in the foreground, obviously we have echinacea in the mid kind of section here. That is Miscanthus sinensis, which shoots up a pretty feathery, uh, silvery reed at the top. And in the back is a lilac. So um, the lilac would be blooming very soon. And, um, and so there you go, perennial plant gardening. That's just one basic example. And um, I like to show it to people because, um, yeah, anyway, I, I think people, it, Perennial plant sounds like a concession, but it, it has color, it's low maintenance. Um, really, there's not a lot of downsides. So this is a uh, alternate lawn. And um, this is, so joining the master gardeners has opened my eyes in all sorts of ways. And Dorothea is a master gardener in Guelph. And she really, really knows her plants, works at Royal City Nursery. And she showed me her backyard and she knows how I feel about lawns. And she has the most incredible lawn alternative, which is a kind of mix. So that is a, that's an, a lawn. And to some people that doesn't look like a perfect lawn. To me, it looks even better than that because throughout the season, it'll flower. And there's white clover, you've got potentilla and you have a uh, strawberry, creeping strawberry. And it serves exactly the purpose that a lawn should, which is, you know, it, it separates the beds, it'll tolerate a decent amount of traffic. Um, this doesn't actually require as much mowing because all of these plants only grow so high. They're not going to grow up and flop over like, you know, the guy who lives three doors down from you drives everybody nuts. His lawn, no, these plants aren't going to do that. Uh, it only, only gets so tall. 
Um, but all of this flowering, like that white clover flowering, that supports a ton of pollinator activity, which is great. And these plants, um, so you've got mock strawberry, uh, potentilla, uh, and white clover. They are much tougher than the Kentucky blue grass seed that you might buy. Uh, you have to be careful because they can creep. Um, they're they might actually be too aggressive. So watch that they don't take over your beds or spread to your neighbors. Um, with a bit of maintenance, not a big problem. They're not weeds by any means, um, but they also put down deeper roots, which goes back to my earlier point about the perennials. More roots, more better. Um, especially the potentilla is very drought tolerant. And so what you end up with when everybody else's lawn goes dormant in the heat, heat, heat of the summer, um, this would still have some chlorophyll in the leaves, It'd still look relatively good. And um, because we're talking water and we're talking about dormancy, if you're committed to the lawn, that's okay. Uh, we can still be friends. You don't have to check off um, <laughs> or check out of this, this webinar. Uh, stick with us. If you've got a lawn that you love and you worry about it um, midsummer when it gets hot, 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 and you wanna water the heck out of it to quote unquote, keep it alive, don't. It's just dormant, it'll come back. So, um, and I mean, yeah, Scott's not just paying me to say this. It's true, your lawn will come back strong and healthy. Lawns are kind of a cool, moist crop. So they look best in the spring and the fall. If it goes brown in the summer, it is not dead. Stop watering it, it'll come back. But if you have this sort of alt lawn plant selection, it's gonna look better. So do this instead, is my opinion. Two stats. Uh, and this is not just a campaign against lawn, it's just been a recent theme, for, theme of mine. Two stats. In the United States, homeowners apply as much fertilizer to lawns as the total agriculture industry. To me, that's staggering. Now, granted, we're talking a lot about Florida, Arizona, California, where people are growing lawns on sandy soils in the heat, heat, heat. Um, which is not really a good place to grow a lawn, but if you've ever flown into an airport in Texas or Arizona and you see the brown, 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 and then you see those perfect distinct lines with the green, totally unsustainable. So think about it partly in this context, but Canadians are using way more fertilizer than they ought to as well. 40 to 60% of this lawn fertilizer is lost to runoff anyway. Now, especially in sandier soils. So it depends on where you are. And it also depends on how high you are. Um, and how the water moves across your property. But these are some really impressive stats. And to me, um, you know, this is a presentation about <laughs> environmentalism. Manuf the manufacture of chemical fertilizer is very environmentally intensive, or energy intensive rather, and environmentally damaging. Um, so I'm in the organic food business. One of the reasons I believe in organics is because managing soil fertility is we can minimize a lot of that um, synthetic nitrogen, which is produced with a lot of natural gas and um, net net pretty harmful to the environment. So something to consider. This is those stats come from Nature's Best Hope. That's the book I was telling you about. It was just released in February 2020. So um, bringing nature home was 2008. This is his most recent book, Doug Tellamy. Um, really great thing to read. Uh, <clears throat> Dad's daffodils. So I put this in here because it's that time of year. Daffodils are coming up and some people are crazy. Uh, I guess it just runs in some families. I don't know. Uh, so Dad's got about 20,000 daffodils. This has nothing to do with water. It's just a spring thing. Um, but that gives way to about 2 million dandelions. And um, I guess the reason I keep this here is because we have a pretty laissez-faire approach to um, weeds between us. I, you know, I lived at this property, the 10 acre garden for years. Uh, even after university, I went back, I was slave to all that lawn. Um, but letting the dandelions go is okay. It's fine. Um, you can eat them and uh, they're delightful for pollinators. And so what happens with dad's 20,000 daffodils, because he loves that show, is they don't naturalize if you immediately mow them down after they've bloomed. So if you're thinking of sticking daffodils in your lawn, do it. It's a great show in the early spring when we need it. But be ready for this, which is that green floppiness. You got to let the green floppiness stay until it flops, because that's where it's going to return the energy back to the bulbs if you want it to come back next year. So anyway, 
just something about that. So what do we call all of this stuff? We call it fusion gardening. Now, kind of an all encompassing term, uh, but fusion gardening refers to sort of a body of knowledge or a school of thinking in landscape design. And it's handy to have this term because you can just go online and say fusion gardening. You can contact Landscape Ontario and say, I want a garden designer or landscaper who has taken the course because there's a course on fusion gardening so that they're going to incorporate this stuff into my property. And um, not only is it going to be more beautiful because all these drought tolerant plants look better under stress um, as we experience more inevitable drought, but you, for the most part, are you benefit from living upstream. <laughs> uh, if you aren't doing this for you, you're doing this for the people downriver in Dunville who have been having worse and worse flood problems year over year. And it is our responsibility to be mindful of our neighbors downstream. And I remind my father-in-law of that because he lives up on Dean and Guelph, which is at the top of the hill. And I live down on water, which is named that because we're at the bottom of the hill right next to the river. So whenever my basement floods, I curse my father-in-law and all the people living up on Dean who aren't incorporating this sort of stuff. Because if we manage our properties the right way, um, we can retain a lot more water on our properties. That includes the native plants I was telling you about. The fusion is more innovative than that. So anyway, this is just a plug. If this presentation is clicking with any part of you, you can find Dad and I in the Toronto Star on Saturdays. New Homes and Garden section. We're online too. So we did write about this. So <clears throat> this is a soak away pit. And I think it's really interesting because um, it slows down that crashing rainfall. So again, the storm rain versus the gentle summer rain. We're going to get more storm rains. It's just a fact. And um, what the soak away pit does is it turns it into a feature in the garden. Um, so you, what they've done here is they've basically dug out a dry pond and they've filled it with looser and looser aggregate material. So you get to the top, you have this sort of beach stone that's quite pretty. And, um, and then you have these sort of artistic features, which can look any which way. And if you, if you look in the top of the frame, you can see a chain. And that is a rain chain. And a rain chain can be, I've seen some Japanese tea houses with rain chains. I've seen homes, I've seen pool houses. Um, they're cool. They look nice. In the winter, they'll get a really neat icicle on them. Um, but they also help slow down the flow of water because that crashing is so harmful, especially if it hits asphalt. It'll just run over and back up that system we were talking about, that municipal infrastructure, or it'll end up in my basement, or it'll end up in the basements of people living in Dunville. <laughs> Huge societal costs. But if we slow it down, um, it gives your property, the plants on your property, the soil on your property, the opportunity to absorb it a little more slowly, right? And um, so fusion, fusion gardening, fusion garden designers incorporate, there's the rain chain, you can see it better, uh, some of that thinking into the way that they, um, they design. And so this is, this is from the fusion feature garden at Canada Blooms a few years ago. That glass jug shows sort of the horizons of the aggregates that you're using in that silk away pit. And then underneath that is just bare soil because bare soil is really just really, really, really fine aggregates. So it gets finer and finer and finer, fine, almost like a Brita filter so that it can seep back down into the ground. That's what water wants to do. Um, and so they put this jar uh, for demonstration and you can see the water flowing through it. Kind of cool. So, uh, looking for hard surfaces. So. This is from uh, the world's most environmentally friendly gas shed. I wish my dad had an electric lawnmower. He doesn't, so he needs to put his diesel fuel somewhere. Uh, that's his gas shed with a green roof. And the green roof is really neat um, because this time of year, there's a mother goose that nests her eggs up there reliably. They've been living there for 15 years. And I got a real kick out of it. She is so aggressive when you go in there to fill up the, the, the tractor or the, the lawnmower. <laughs> Can't tell you the number. Of, and I don't know if it's the same other goose every spring, but I like to think it is. Uh, she definitely knows how to pick her spot. So not only is it a great place to nest your eggs, um, what you have when you have a green roof is again, it's a softer surface that's gonna absorb and retain a lot more water. It's also gonna create a bit of habitat depending on the species that you choose. So birds and insects are gonna enjoy it more. Um, but those, again, you fly over 
Waterloo region, you see all this asphalt shingling. That is not natural. That's where rain crashes down, hits the municipal infrastructure, bad. So maybe you don't want to put a green roof on your house, but if you were thinking of putting up a pool shed or a garden shed, um, rather than adding another 150 square feet of asphalt shingle, consider doing something like this because um, not only is it environmentally important, it's good for um, managing water during these downpours, um, it looks cool and it changes throughout the season. And, this, and there's some sedums here and there's so many different types of sedums. Like go to your garden center, go knock, like, go knock yourself out. Um, you can create kind of a neat little mosaic and throughout the seasons, it looks awesome. <clears throat> so scree gardening is a branch of fusion gardening. And I guess you'd say scree gardening is a form of biomimicry, which, you know, the best designs are, uh, which is to say you're mimicking a natural environment that might be similar to a very artificial environment. So one of the things we get in new home subdivisions and, you know, no disregard for anybody who lives in one, we all got to live somewhere, but these new home subdivision, um, often the, the top soil has been scraped away. Uh, and replaced with subpar soil. There's very little tree cover um, and a lot of wind, especially in the west part of Waterloo region. There's new, there's no new subdivisions kind of between there and New Hamburg. Looks like a beautiful place to live. Probably get a lot of wind through there. Um, and over time, as the trees that have been planted fill out, um, that area is going to change drastically. But right now, near to uh, newer subdivisions, you're going to have that problem: wind, dry, arid. And um, rather than putting in the interlock, it's not going to help. It's just going to create baking heat in the summer. Think about putting down a scree garden. So what is similar to what I just described? High up in the mountains, you get scree. So the freeze thaw cycles up in the Alps, they break up the rocks and create a loose aggregate like this. And then um, you have seeds that flow through in the wind, get caught. What species are thriving there? Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. So you can do this with gravel. And um, the good thing is if you do it with gravel rather than just the interlock, when you get that inevitable rain, which you will, um, it can soak down. Um, <clears throat> uh, but when you don't have that rain, I can appreciate um, that, sorry, I can appreciate that um, it can be very dry as well because wind dries out soil. So um, you can look up scree gardening. You get all sorts of different like types of plant material. Pines do really well in a, like a small pine, pine will do well um, in a scree garden or different types of uh, sedums. Again, uh, hens and chicks, those types of plants, but it looks kind of like this. And uh, that's what you can do with that marginal corner of your property, which nothing seems to grow. Uh, I implore you, not to just pave it over. Um, okay, pollinator hotels, I think most people know about them. Uh, habitat is another part of the equation that's driving pre downward pressure on our pollinator populations. Um, so Dan and I are massive proponents of being messy, messy gardeners. <laughs> and uh, there's different ways of doing pollinators at hotels. I always, again, encourage people not to buy anything Look at what you've got lying around. Um, this, these hanging pots are really interesting. I think they were um, actually for ladybugs. Uh, and it was little clay pots. This was at the Botanical Garden in Warsaw, uh, which I actually don't recommend going to. It was bombed to smithereens. And um, this is the most interesting thing that they have happening there now. It's kind of sad, to be honest. Um, no, no disrespect to the city of Warsaw or the people, but this was the most interesting takeaway. Um, just some straw in a pot hanging upside down and you get all sorts of interesting bug life in there. And um, it's a bug's life. We depend on them. They're at the lower level, the lower trophic levels. This is dad's, um, it's kind of an everything hotel. You say pollinator hotel. He actually has snakes living in the bottom of it there. Um, the whole system. So right behind him is a little stream that flows into a pond. So the back side of this is quite damp. The front side of it, um, it's not, and this was all just leftover building materials. He's quite proud of that. So pollinator hotels, uh, if you haven't built one, there's still time the rest of your life. There's always, a, there's always time to build a pollinator hotel, but when you're looking at the materials you want to throw away, uh, think, ask yourself, you know, could I create a texture? Could I create a habitat with this? Um, be creative. That's, that's the one thing you get to do in your, your own garden. 
be creative. So this is, um, again, maintenance is the enemy. I'm with you. I don't like crawling up and down rows on my hands and knees, pulling out weeds. Totally. But lawns are not low. You got to mow them. You still got to pull weeds. And their biological services don't provide a lot of value. So here's another virtually zero maintenance idea for you. And this is perfect timing. This time of year is perfect um, because you can sow something like this. And this is simply, you can see grass on either side of it. Uh, we just drove down the row um, with a rototiller, which you actually don't have to do um, if you have bare dirt. But if you're converting grass, use the rototiller or use a shovel. And then um, we used sand as sort of a bulking agent and just a bunch of leftover flower seeds. And uh, call Ontario Seed Company. That's a Waterloo company in King Street. And um, ask them for their pollinator mix or wildflower mix. They have a bunch of different seed mixes. Um, and it's cheap. So you mix that up in a bucket with sand and then you just spread it by hand and you water it in and it'll be a continuous, it'll be a continuous change of color, like a living um, canvas throughout the season. And all of these flowers, including the sunflowers, support a lot of pollinators. And because the seeding rate is high enough and most of the zinnias are really good for this. Um, I usually just use whatever leftover seeds I have. Uh, in the part of the veggie garden, we don't get to planting. Um, uh, you can you could put in perennials or you can just do an annual flower mix. You'll have an endless supply of cut flowers for the house. And um, if the seeding rate is high enough, they're going to outcompete the weeds. That's the amazing thing. So um, it wouldn't cost you a lot more than lawn seed would. And um, once it gets going, it's amazing. You'll have neighbors stopping at your front yard to, to look at this. And it's so dense. Uh, they're actually competing with one another. So you have good flowers competing with good flowers rather than, you know, a specimen Japanese maple or lawn, <laughs> really being up on lawn tonight, um, competing with weeds. So you're creating good competition and um, you can put this in any type of bed you wish. So um, yeah. And the other thing too is you're going to lose a lot less to erosion with something like this as well, because all of that green matter, all of that plant matter actually captures a lot of rainfall. So in a heavy rain, um, before it before the rain hits the soil, the worst thing for rain is bare soil. Before it hits the soil, it's gonna hit all of this green matter that's gonna hold it in the leaves and the petals, uh, and it'll trickle down. And then all of the roots growing there, that dense root mass is gonna hold a lot of water. And uh, a lot of these flowers are gonna look just fine during a drought. So don't even have to water them a whole lot. Um, that is a, that's an apple fence, which uh, I'm looking 751, we got 10 minutes. Um, I wanna make sure we talk about mulch before this is over. Um, <clears throat> That's an apple fence. And I put that there because if you're thinking of building a fence, maybe you got a bad neighbor. Um, I just want to say before you load up the kids, put them in the van, drive to your lumber yard and, you know, start paying for this stuff. Um, think about living alternatives. <laughs> and, you know, a native hedge is great or best. Cedar hedge is great. Uh, cedars are really good if you have a wet spot, especially. And again, this is a water presentation. You see cedar over here. You got that, that's a wet spot. That's a chicken coop. This whole area is wet. Um, a cedar hedge is great for a wet spot. Consider putting in a cedar hedge instead of uh, a fence, because unlike a fence, which is dead wood, uh, a cedar is growing. It's 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 providing um, ecological services. You'll find a lot more birds hiding and nesting in a cedar fence than you will in a wooden fence, a cedar hedge versus a wooden fence. So consider putting in a cedar, or if you're looking for something a little different, these are apples. And um, there is some wood here. There's about every 10 feet, there's a four by four uh, post with wires. And um, we just use dwarf apples and we trained them to the wires. And um, it's cool because in the, obviously apple trees flower and the flowers support a ton of pollinator life. And then you have a harvest and we don't spray these really with anything. Um, so you get scabby apples, we make cider and applesauce. Uh, if you wanted to get into growing fruits, there's lots you can learn. Um, 
in a lot of ways you can get a perfect apple. Uh, but that's not really the point of this. The point of this is just to create a division on the property between on the left, the vegetable garden, on the right, this pathway to the chicken coop. And um, it's an alternative to what would have otherwise probably been a split rail cedar fence. And of course, each of those little apple trees has roots in the ground, which more roots, more better. So um, I put that there for that reason. Also, I mean, I'm somewhat defensive of the privet hedge. You know, further so you know, the more invasive it becomes, they kind of went out of style. But we have a privet hedge at our house, and I love it. I mean, it, it blooms for just a short little, uh, short little while. But when it's blooming, it's alive uh, with insects, and it's pretty. And um, you can't kill it. You can pretty much prune it whenever you want. And um, it serves the same purpose as a fence. I live on a busy street. Nobody's ever walking into my backyard because there's a privet hedge there. And um, again, it's got roots in the ground. So any um, anybody who's listening to this, who's thinking, oh, we need to put in a fence, stop before you do. Now's a good time to be shopping for hedging material or living fence material like you might with this apple fence. So those are some Johnny Golds at Rosemore Garden in the UK. Anyway, just show you some creative stuff. Uh, apples don't have to be grown in orchards. They work really well in, um, they work really well in urban environments. They can be trained to all sorts of espalier apples. They can be trained in really interesting ways. This is another living alternative to the built structure. So you'll notice a theme here. Rather than going out and purchasing lumber, um, you can plant a playhouse. So we actually have one of these. I had, I don't, did I put the picture in of ours? Dang, um, I didn't. <laughs> so, um, what this is, is this is a playhouse at a garden in the UK. The first place we saw this was actually at a Waldorf school in Germany. I had one growing up made out of pussy willow. You can use forsythia. Lots of people are pruning or some still, <laughs> um, or you can go out and buy the transplants, but just simply sticking the, sticking the twigs in the ground of, especially of something aggressive like a pussy willow or a forsythia, you stick them in the ground in a circle and you let them establish themselves. And then you tie them together at the top. And what you have is a living playhouse because kids who want to play outside, they want their own space. And um, this is one way to provide them that without building them a playhouse out of lumber or whatever you might use. So the worst are the plastic playhouses. Don't build them a plastic playhouse, plant them one, and they can go hang out. This is a really big one that dad's standing at. Uh, but you can build small ones and the kids can go in there, make mud pies or whatever, hang out, read books. And in the top where it's growed and you can kind of... It doesn't have to be as elaborate as this. You can weave it together into almost like a crown and you'll have birds nesting there. And uh, it's a really special little thing that is dead simple to do because these species like a pussy willow, for example, uh, you almost can't kill it. And another, like the other benefit of using a pussy willow is if you have a wet spot on your property, it's going to do really, really well there because they just love having wet feet. So um, again, if you put a plant that likes being wet in a wet spot, um, not only is the plant going to thrive, you're going to do more of that, that of your civic duty, which is retaining water upstream so we have less flooding and um, so that your garden looks better during a drought, during the heat of summer. So <clears throat> soil health, that's where I should really bring Sam in here. Um, Sam, my wife, the soil specialist. Uh, soil health. So there's a few things you can do for soil health and it really is important for a lot of reasons because a living soil is going to provide a lot more nutrients to the plants um, with a much lesser fertilizer demand. Because um, if you have organic matter on the surface, like such as mulch, <laughs> uh, natural mulch, um, you're going to have microorganisms and earthworms that are breaking down that organic matter, leaves, wood, straw, doesn't really matter, um, and turning it into nutrients mostly often carbon uh, some, and nitrogen, essential nutrients for your plants to thrive. And as they move through the soil, mobilizing these nutrients and, and making them accessible to the plants, they're actually creating soil structure. And um, soil structure is really important for all sorts of reasons. Um, and the thinking about this has really only started to change in the last few years. This is where dad and I are actually a little bit different. He still Actually, this is the first season that he won't be pulling out his rototiller because a lot of 
kind of more old school gardeners, and I'm sure there's some on this call, and that's okay, love fluffing up the soil. They love firing up the rototiller in the spring. And while that creates a really nice seed bed, if you're direct sowing plants, it's pretty much terrible for everything else. Because what you do when you rototill or if you excessively cultivate is you break those soil structures. So all those little tunnels, all those little webs. Um, I don't want to get too scientific, but you have this cation exchange capacity, which is how nutrients get mobilized through the soil. Um, and I don't want to get too so too specific scientific because I can't really explain it that well because I probably don't even understand it that well. Sam might. Um, but all of this stuff gets broken down and destroyed when you tear the soil apart. And um, it also, the structure, it's strength. So if you have those storm-like rainfalls that come along and pound on the top of the soil, um, you're going to have a lot more soil loss and nutrient loss, like the 40 to 60% of fertilizer that ends up in rivers and streams um, when you have weak soils. So what I'm saying is resist the urge to get out that rototiller, resist the urge to go out there and dig your compost into the soil this spring. Stay inside, have a beer, have a coffee, eat a cake, but don't dig because if you just leave that compost, which is a really great addition, uh, if you leave the compost, say two and a half inch layer of compost, very generous, fabulous thing to do for your plants. The earthworms and the microbes, they're gonna come up to the surface, they're gonna pull it down and in doing so, they're gonna create pathways that build that soil structure. So just leave it and mulch on top of that compost. You could put compost on top of mulch, doesn't really make sense. Put the mulch on top of the compost uh, because in doing so, that's my garden. I use straw. I like straw. Uh, Dad uses wood bark mulch. Um, in doing so, you're going to retain more moisture. So benefits of mulch, up to 70% less watering because the other thing you have less of is um, evaporation because it creates sort of like a blanket over the soil. And um, you're going to get a lot less weeds because weeds want to settle in that perfect seed bed, kind of like the rototiller seed bed for the seeds that you were putting in anyway. So um, you're going to have a lot less weeds, you're going to have a lot less erosion because the mulch itself um, is going to minimize the impact of the rainfall uh, hammering down on it. And it's also going to regulate temperature better. Um, so especially if you use a lighter mulch, like I use a golden straw, um, you're going to get on the really, really, really hot days in the middle of summer, you're not going to get as much um, heat stress. So um, mulch, 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 mulch. Um, this is Share Agriculture Foundation. I feel quite passionately about it. It's a not-for-profit that supports farmers in South and Central America, which again, ground zero for climate change, drought stress. Their way of life is being totally turned upside down. This is a grower who's a beneficiary of a share program. And uh, the reason I put his picture here is he supports his family off two and a half acres of corn and we're talking off the beaten path. And this is the corn crop at a ground level. And uh, if you drive through Waterloo region, you'll notice our farmers don't do this because uh, it's all done by hand. He goes into the jungle, he strips trees, not so much that they can't survive, but he'll, he'll collect leaves, organic matter, just to have that mulch on the soil because he can't afford fertilizer and the drought stress is so extreme in that part of the world. So um, from the people who depend on their crops for livelihood, there's a lesson in mulch. And if you're interested in um, what Share Agriculture Foundation is doing, I encourage you to look them up. Um, my business, Collins Foods, 1% of our sales goes that way because um, I just believe in it and uh, they believe in good practices. So less digging, more compost. There's your earthworms. Brilliant. Uh, there's my food business. And there's our book. There's the Highway of Heroes. Uh, 117,000 trees, one for each Canadian soldier uh, fallen in uh, times of war for a country. Um, so that's been Dad's project up and down the 401 corridor, the Highway of Heroes. There's a tree planting ceremony. And... Thank you, because I don't want to go too much over time. Scott hasn't cut me off yet. So before he does, I want to wrap it up. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, is it now question time? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ben. I'll hop in here. Great. Give you a chance to catch your breath, too. I hope um, that there yeah, was that was great.
Uh, I really appreciate uh, the, uh, the, the time you covered rain barrels and uh, stormwater as somebody who works in water services here at the region. Uh, yeah, those are issues near and dear to us. So yeah, but, uh, but it was all great. Thank you, Ben. And, and Scott, just you would probably agree small things make a huge difference, don't they? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and, and yeah, there, it's, there's a multitude of benefits, really, like you said, right? It's, it's, it's helpful for the garden. It's helpful for, uh, for stormwater. Um, yeah, not to mention some of the, the pollinator techniques you mentioned. And it doesn't cost a lot. So yeah, I've just turned on the chat function uh, oh, in Zoom. Fun. So if anybody has questions that they've been sitting on, you can start uh, tapping them in there. Um, and while you're doing that, uh, I'll just let you know that, uh, so this is the fourth and final naturescaping webinar run here uh, by us here at the region of Waterloo. But next Wednesday night, there is another webinar at seven o'clock. Uh, it's offered by Reap Green Solutions, which is a local environmental group. And uh, it's called Your Rain Barrel Questions Answered. So one of their uh, staff members who's very knowledgeable about rain barrels is going to be giving some uh, uh, some introductory ideas and some more advanced techniques, ways you can use your rain barrel, um, and uh, and also taking lots of questions. So if you're interested, look that up on Eventbrite. It's uh, that's the same platform that you signed up for this webinar. It's called Your Rain Barrel Questions Answered next Wednesday. Um, yeah, and uh, like I get. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Ben. I was just say I can see some questions coming in here in the chat. Yeah, yeah, let's uh, hop right up to one of those. Uh, Perfect. Okay, Roseanne is wondering, should you leave leaves with black spots on them in the garden as mulch? Um, I would compost them first. If you have a uh, compost pile, break them down. Uh, it'll get hot enough, hopefully kill the pathogens. And, you'll, and also you'll move them somewhere in the garden where hopefully um, they're they're around plants that aren't going to be affected by that. It's a shame to throw them away, um, but leaving them there might pose a problem, depending on the time of year as well. So if you have a compost, best thing to do is put those leaves in the compost, turn them into compost, and then use that goodness, that nutrient, put it back into the soil. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Roseanne has a question. She's wondering, uh, Oh, sorry, Roseanne's the one I just read. Sharon says, as a senior, I've tried to make my garden low maintenance, but this year mustard garlic is everywhere. Even the ground cover under my shrubs is filled. What can mm. I do? I feel your pain. A friend of mine just made a huge batch of garlic mustard pesto because <laughs> it is edible. Um, and there's been an invasive species pesto making movement here in Guelph, but maybe we're too crazy over here in Guelph. Uh, really very difficult one, Sharon. Um, I've started using cardboard to smother uh, my most aggressive weeds. So I put down a layer of, I, I've got Creeping Charlie at my place, um, cardboard, garden soil, and then overseed or put down side if I'm growing a lawn there. Um, you can do the same in your garden as well. So put down cardboard. The cardboard will break, eventually break down, but hopefully just to try and smother it um, because it is a, it's a really tough problem to have i'm afraid i wish there was an easy solution um, the other thing is if you've got a hot part of the property um, you can try solarizing with a dark tarp so put down like a black tarp leave it down for six to eight weeks it takes a while and the heat of the sun will burn off everything it's non-selective you lose everything but you might you might be able to kill the majority of it you'll only ever set it back um, uh, and that's unfortunately the best you can do Okay. Um, and before we take the next question, I'll, I'll let everybody know that a video recording of this webinar is going to be on the region's YouTube page. So youtube.com slash region of Waterloo. So if you want to go back and listen to anything that Ben said or review a slide, uh, it'll be there, should be up on the website tomorrow. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is from Emily. She's wondering, do you recommend the no-till procedure uh, in a vegetable garden? hundred percent. So that's exactly what I'm talking about is um, no till minimum till um, Charles Dowding in the UK has a great YouTube channel. I think he calls himself the no dig gardener. Um, and really the only reason you should be disturbing the soil is to heal in a new plant. Um, 
and otherwise you're just generously layering compost and mulch um, and, and preserving that soil structure. So yes, that's exactly what I'm referring to. Okay, uh, Jocelyn on, who's watching on YouTube is wondering uh, if, if it's a good idea to make mulch from just your general yard waste, leaves, sticks, and twigs. 100%, yep, that's the best, um, that's the best source for uh, compost, really, and from a municipal standpoint, um, trucking off all your green bin waste, only to have it composted at a municipal facility, doesn't make a lot of sense. You've got a lot of nutrient goodness there. Break it down in your compost and um, start with that. And then if you don't have enough, buy in what you have to. Maybe get some manure if you know any farmers. Um, but leaves are good. It's a, it's a ratio of um, green and brown matter. So the green matter is grass clippings and leaves. And the brown matter is the stuff from your kitchen, actually. And if you don't uh, compost your kitchen scraps, you're missing out on a lot of nitrate nitrogen rich material. So the carbon material is mostly going to come from, uh, sorry, hang on, do I have this backwards? Yeah, so the nitrogen material is mostly going to come from the um, brown and the green will be the carbon. So uh, you want both, a mix. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, oh, Scott, I have a question for you. Does yeah. Region of Waterloo also have a composting program? We do, yeah. We have our green bin program uh, that's been around for several years now. And, and, and yeah, but, we're getting good, up, good uptake on that. Do you have, um, like, do you sell composters? Uh, yeah, we, we give them, you can get one for free at the landfill site. Get one for free at the landfill or, site. Sorry, okay. not, not, a big, not a big garden composter, sorry, more like a green bin for, your, for putting your scraps at the curb. Okay, a green bin, for, but you don't have backyard composters. Uh, no, we don't do those currently. Yeah, we used to. Okay. Well, I, uh, you know what? I got a composter for free off Kijiji. <laughs> um, but buy one, build one. Uh, having a backyard composter is just such an important thing to have. Mm, yeah, there was sit one sitting in the backyard uh, of our house when we bought it. Bonus. Score. Inherited that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Patricia's wondering, is there a native climbing vine that would replace my unhappy clematis? Mm, clematis can be really pretty when it's happy. Um, native vine that comes to mind would be like a Virginia creeper. I'll be upfront. I'm coming from the world of agriculture. Uh, so my plant knowledge is not fantastic. Virginia creeper is the only native vine that comes to mind. I'm almost positive it's native. Uh, a non-native vine that's very aggressive, but might be kind of pretty, <laughs> is a, a trumpet vine. Um, now, some people will not endorse that recommendation, but uh, hummingbirds love them. Uh, pollinators love them. They flower like crazy. Um, so consider that as well, but you'll have to keep it under control. Like when you're pruning a trumpet vine, you almost want to kill it. <laughs> uh, think you've killed it about once a year, otherwise it'll take over your house. Otherwise, uh, yeah, Virginia creeper. And I, unfortunately, that's about all I've got off the top of my head. Yeah. Um... Sharon, uh, she says, my grass is very poor under my 45-year-old tree. Uh, any suggestions? Um, well, you can get a shade mix grass seed, uh, which will be blended to more shade tolerant um, varieties. Because uh, a, a grass seed is not one type of seed. It's a, it's a blend, right? You've got ryegrass and bluegrass. Um, so you could, you could select for that or um, you could give up and plant something else, put in a woodland garden, depending on you know, the, the sort of design or style of your garden, put it in a woodland style with ferns and hostas and generously mulched, that can look really good under a tree. Or um, that creeping strawberry that I mentioned uh, in uh, Dorothea's garden, that's another alternative. It's kind of a ground cover, so you would manage it a bit differently, um, but that would be something else that you could try. The next two questions, uh, I think, are very related. So I'm going to give them both to you at once. Uh, mm -hmm. Carl, Carol is wondering, do you need a membrane for a roof garden? And Peggy is wondering, how would one convert a shingled garden roof to a living roof? Both good questions. Um, the membrane is necessary if you don't want water to come through, yes. <laughs> so there's, um, there's like a contractor material 
that you would put as the first layer. And then you would put, um, we have gravel in ours just for drainage. Um, and then we have uh, garden soil on top of that. And there's a screen in there um, as well, like um, almost like a chicken wire to kind of hold it in place very, so that because of the slope. Um, so the best thing to do is <laughs> frankly, go to the hardware store, show them a picture of what you've got and see what materials they have because every roof is a little different. So a lot of plans online. The other thing you'll have to consider is the weight bearing capacity of the structure. So um, uh, because all of that soil, when it's retaining water can get very, very heavy. Um, and I don't, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there is a conversion. It's basically like having a full snow load all the time. And then when you do have a full snow load, that much more. So, um, Yes, a membrane is important if you don't want leaking. Uh, how would one convert a shingled garden roof? The shingles, you know, they're made of asphalt, so they're not going to contribute anything to the growing medium, but they're not really going to harm either. So, it's, but they are heavy, so um, you kind of have to make a judgment call whether or not the structure can support the shingles plus um, a built garden structure on top of them. Um, but the shingles would help probably wick some of the moisture away. Uh, and prevent water from coming through. Uh, I'm not totally expert on this, but there are um, kind of like turnkey systems that start with just like the plywood roof uh, and build out from there and have different layers. Um, so it kind of depends a lot on your budget. It depends on the structure. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to grow. Um, but I would say you don't necessarily have to discard the shingles. I guess that wasn't your question, but... Um, how would one convert a shingled garden? Yeah, you could ostensibly put it right on top um, because I hate to see shingles get thrown away. <laughs> they don't do very well in landfill. Yeah. Um, uh, and Angela's wondering about the name of the plants uh, on the shed roof. I think you mentioned them during the presentation. Just wondering if you oh. can repeat the name of that plant. So, I mean, sedums is broad, um, but sedums do well in that type of environment because um, they require like absolutely zero maintenance. And the best thing to do is go to a good garden center with a nice plant selection and ask to see sort of like what they have available. Because there's tall sedums, they're short, um, the kind of uh, they're different colors, you get purple, green, gray. Um, and that's just sort of the general. So um, you can kind of knock yourself out with that. Some people use grasses. Um, hens and chicks would do fine up there, like succulent type stuff. Um, so that's that's that was what in the picture that's what you're looking at. Danielle is wondering uh so are bugs good for gardens when growing herbs and vegetables like radishes and peppers? So bugs are good for gardens when growing. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um well that's a difficult question because there's good bugs and there's bad bugs and there are bugs that you know aphids and things can create insect pressure. There's a reason we have all of these insecticides. Um, but bugs can be tolerated and you don't necessarily have to blast them to oblivion with, you know, a non-selective insecticide. Um, if you see bugs in your garden, it's great. It means you have a habitat there. Uh, hopefully they're landing on the flowers and pollinating plants that can support them and also depend on them for pollination. And I'm looking at the crops that your radishes and peppers, um, radishes don't require don't need, no, bugs are not necessarily good for radishes. Radishes don't require pollination. Um, peppers, be fine. I mean, as long as they're not eating the plant, if they're landing on the pepper flower and then taking off, great. But if they're eating the plant, you wanna protect the pepper. And the best way to do that is with row covers. Um, so you can use um, sort of like a spun polyester material that'll allow water through, but it'll keep the bugs off. And the other thing is, is at this time of year, the shoulder season, um, it can protect against a light frost um, for your tender plants. So uh, you can look up row covers or a cloche, which is like just like a lid you put on top of the, of the plant. Those types of uh, insect controls can work very, very well. Um, so those, that's my thoughts on bugs in the veggie garden. Okay, uh, next question is from Daphne who wonders, how do you ensure the seeds you want to come up will germinate 
when you have uh, a heavy layer of compost and mulch on your garden? That's a good question. So um, no dig or minimum till is much, much easier when you're putting in um, like a plant, like a transplant, or you've bought a perennial in the pot. Uh, that's, that's the easiest because you have all of this trash and material on the, on the garden that needs to be there. Um, but if you're trying to direct sow seeds into the garden, um, what you have to do is kind of basically just remove that cover. And so you create, if you're planting in rows, you create like a strip of bare soil. So, you know, it's a, it's a necessary, I'm not going to say evil, but it, it is a necessary um, the necessity for direct sowing seeds is to ex expose it, open it up a bit, uh, only where you're direct sowing. You want to keep the mulch around all of it. And then um, if you feel like, you know, you need to create a seed bed, you can do it in that sort of trench in that row. So like a no-till planter on a farm is a typical planter that can just cut through the trash. Um, so you're still going to dig it in a bit. And, um, and that's okay. So use a trowel, use, you know, I like to use a hoe and just create sort of like a, a furrow and plant normally, but it's really about minimizing the disturbance. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the best way to create, is only create um, uh, those soil conditions exactly where you're planting the seeds. And it's not that hard to do, it's actually less work. Um, Angela's wondering if you have any tips about anthills in the lawn, uh, what to do about those. I, well, I mean, there's um, diatomaceous earth you can use is a chemical free um, insecticide. So they'll scarify the ants as they're crawling around. Um, some people pour boiling water down the ant hills. I mean, I'm not really an extermination expert, to be honest. I have them too. I ignore them. Um, ants are not going to be harmful to too many of the crops that you're growing, any that I can think of. So um, if you want to, like, it really depends on your philosophy. If you have a scorched earth mentality, there's plenty of products in the uh, uh, insecticide aisle at the hardware store. Um, if you want to try a natural approach, lean towards the diatomaceous earth or maybe the boiled water method. Um, and that's, yeah, there's, that, that's big, but what you can do. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've got some ants that uh, make their way into my house. Uh, every summer. So that's my ongoing battle too. Yeah, we have that. And I can't resist bringing peonies into the kitchen because we have really nice peonies and the ants love peonies. Um, so we just vacuum them up or we have this minor confession. We have ant traps in the house, uh, but in the lawn, I've never bothered to, to get rid of a hell in the lawn personally. Okay. Uh, Ellen's question here is uh, for seeding, seeding down pollinator gardens seeds and sand suggestions to keep birds out until they sprout well, that's a good question um so one thing i have to say about that is you want builder sand a sharp sand um it's like a really coarse sand and um you can to be honest the birds are probably not going to work that hard for most of the seed the um sunflower seeds you would have to bury because they're a pretty large seed and they would be attractive to birds. So um, the way you can do that is to just um, kind of rake them in and get some soil cover on them. And most birds are not gonna dig through the soil to get a sunflower seed. They'll pull a sunflower seed out of a flower or they pick it up off the ground. But if you, if you rake it in, um, that'll, that'll probably minimize um, most of the grazing by birds. Uh, someone's wondering about the name of the grass that was behind the sheaf of purple cone flowers. Uh, I think that was the picture of your dad's naturalized yeah. garden berm. Yeah, so that's um, Miscanthus sinensis, which is a non-native um, perennial grass. Miscanthus sinensis or Chinese silver grass. Okay, uh, and Helen is... Uh, has got a, I don't think it's a question, but she just says, I'd be aware of planting trumpet vine it has very invasive roots that can penetrate into basements uh, and run under and through stone patios. So Helen's right, um, which is why I make that suggestion with major condition. When you're growing something really invasive like that, if you're even encouraged, 
I mean, I hope she just chooses Virginia Creeper. The Trump vine is really interesting. Um, and, you know, wildlife likes it. It's pretty. Um, you can grow a really invasive species like that in a large enough container. That's what I do with my oregano and my mint. So the mint doesn't take over because similarly, mint is great to have. Uh, we love using it in the kitchen, um, but it can take over. So um, plant it in a container. That's, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Helen. I have to rethink that. Um, if, if you're so inclined, but I, I would also, an apology for just the limitations of my, no, my plant knowledge. I can't, there, I'm sure there's other native vines that you could try as well. Good point. Okay. Uh, Jocelyn is wondering, uh, if creeping Charlie is a problem or something to be concerned about. Yes. Yes. It's terrible. It'll take over everything. Uh, and some people don't mind it. Some people say, oh, it's green. I mean, whatever. Fine. Um, I've been at war with it and there's not a lot of solutions. So that cardboard method I was talking about with, you know, you dig out as much as you can, knock it back as far as you can, put down the cardboard, put down the soil, put down new lawn or whatever. Um, that's the most effective method I've come up with. If it's, and if it's still just, if you're in a new property and it's just creeping in from the neighbors, just fight it back because you don't want that to take over and get hold. Uh, this one's from Mac. He, uh, they're wondering, do praying, mantis, do praying mantises help with insect control? I recently read about purchasing egg sacs. Yeah, um, it's not mainstream. I've never tried it. So I, I, I don't feel qualified to answer it. Um, I mean, praying mantis, they eat, um, they eat insects. So perhaps, um, but um, I would have to research to give a qualified answer. I'm reluctant because it might create another problem would be my fear. Um, sorry, I don't have a better answer on that. Yeah, I don't know much about that myself either. Yeah, that's uh, it, pretty niche. Yeah, and usually, okay. well, and I'll say this for gardening generally, if you hear a really unusual or niche kind of homebrew solution, there's a reason why it hasn't entered the mainstream <laughs> or it hasn't been broadly commercialized. So, um, one place I like to check when I hear these sort of um, exotic solutions is uh, Robert Pavlis has a really great website. Um, it's called Garden Myths. Robert is based in Guelph. He might have been one of your other presenters, Scott, was he? Yeah, that's right. He was with us last week. So so uh, Robert makes a, a job of debunking some of these things. He might have an article on it. I'd start with that because uh, he, you know, but I... Don't have direct experience. Great. Well, we are just about out of time here, and I don't see any other questions in the queue at this point. Uh, um, pop on, pop my video on here, uh, and just, yeah, say thanks again, Ben. Uh, on behalf of the region of Waterloo, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing all your expertise with us. No problem. Yeah, and thanks Thank to you. everybody else. Uh, Danielle, thanks. Denise, Mac, Angela, Scott. Been fun. Yeah. yeah, thanks to everybody who stuck it out here to the end. And uh, and I will say, uh, so we briefly mentioned the rain barrel program that the region has offered uh, every spring. And if you're interested in that, um, go to regionofwaterloo.ca slash conservation. And like I said, we're, we're figuring out how we can still get those discounted rain barrels to people this year. Um, there should be an announcement there uh, in the next week or two. Uh, it's, it's close. So, so uh, yeah, the water conservation site on the region of Waterloo is the place to go for that information. Uh, or you can always email me. I'm happy to answer the questions. So, uh, so yeah, uh, take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, stay well and uh, talk to you later. Take care.